and this is a chance for you to start uh, working on a problem yourself uh, and I guess you can approach that however you're comfortable with I'm going to um, to walk through the problem uh, but if you if you'd like to give yourself more of a challenge I guess I recommend that you go ahead and attempt it on your own uh, let me describe the problem and then maybe give you a sense of how you might approach it okay so we're going to be doing some PKPD modeling of some time averaged biomarker and PK data uh, we've got the results for a phase one single dose study in healthy volunteers where we've got a parallel dose escalation design I've got eight subjects per dose arm uh, we've got several different uh, doses of our drug here, our ME2. Uh, we go from placebo, 1.255, and so on up to 80 milligrams. Uh, the PK we're looking at are plasma concentrations of parent drug, and the biomarker will be ex vivo inhibition of factor 10A activity in plasma. Uh, the PK and biomarkers, uh, biomarker values are m measured at the same times and you can see the listed times here going, it's a dense sampling going from 0 to 24 hours after the dose. And the hands-on exercise will be to model the relationship between the time average factor 10A inhibition and the time average ME2 plasma concentrations. Uh, so by time averaged, I mean you basically take the area under the curve over 24 hours and divide that by 24 hours. So here's the sort of the raw data uh, as shown as spaghetti plots for on the left hand side we have the plasma concentrations versus time for the various so each panel you can see is a different dose group uh, and spaghetti plots overlaid uh, on each other for the individual's data. Same thing on the right for the factor 10A inhibition expressed as percent factor 10A inhibition versus time. Uh, left hand side is uh, looking at factor 10A inhibition versus plasma concentration <coughs> where you've where you've actually got where you've matched them all up by time but what we're going to do is uh, is basically take these plots take the area under the curve divide by 24 and so that for each patient you'll only have one PK value and one PD value and that's what's being plotted here so each blue plot blue point here corresponds to an individual patient uh, and we've plotted them uh, you can see plotted here uh, I've tossed a curve through here to sort of describe it and we can sort of see that you know well something like a, you know an Emax model might might be capable of describing something like that and in fact that's what we're gonna do uh, we're going I'm proposing that you fit a sigmoid Emax model relating our time averaged percent inhibition of factor 10a and it oops, factor 10a activity uh, and we relate that to the time averaged me2 plasma concentrations in each of, each of our subjects so here I've specified the model so here this is our the E bar 24 rep means that uh, time averaged uh, factor 10A inhibition. Uh, that's going to be distributed normal with some mean E hat 24 and some standard deviation sigma. Uh, that E hat 24 is going to be our sigmoid Emax model with an intercept of zero. We've just got Emax. You know, the C bar 24 then is our time average plasma concentration. So I raise that to the gamma and divided by EC50 to the gamma plus C24 to the gamma. Uh, we'll just throw some fairly weakly informative priors at this. Uh, Emax, I'm going to bound between by 0 and 100. I guess the implicit assumption is there is that if the drug has any effect, it is to... Um, you know, it is to increase the percent inhibition. I've explicitly excluded the possibility of it decreasing uh, the percent inhibition by setting a lower bound at zero. Uh, it's pretty reasonable that the upper bound has to be 100 because if you're decreasing something, the most you can decrease it is by 100%. 
Uh, okay, EC50 here, uh, I'm gonna specify as a half normal, um, where, the, where I start with a normal zero to 250 and then chop off the left half. Uh, similar thing for gamma, except I'll make it half normal, zero five. And the sigma, I'm gonna make half Cauchy, uh, zero 10. By the way, for those who might wonder what the rationale behind using the half Cauchy, I point out a particular paper here. Uh, don't have time in our short online thing to go through that, but there is a rationale for that. Okay, so we've got uh, in the course materials, I've provided the data, and this is the data file, uh, path of the data file here. Uh, if for version one, I recommend using linear two as a template. Uh, and, uh, and for this, uh, I've actually already solved the problem in the form of uh, a model here I've called FXA inhibit average one uh, in the model directory. Uh, in the script directory, I have the corresponding R script for running this. And again, they're very much uh, comparable to the linear two case. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to step through also a second version where I'm going to that I'm going to use as an excuse to introduce some additional stand features. In particular, we're going to take a look at uh, vectors and doing vectorized calculations. And uh, I'm going to introduce a couple more program blocks, something called transform parameters and generated quantities, which are additional blocks you can include in stand models. And so they pretty much the same thing, except I stuck twos on the file names instead of one. Okay, so my recommendation, if you want to do this as a individual hands-on example, is actually set aside, focus on how to write the stand model. Uh, for now, I would say just accept the R script as it's written, but focus on the stand model uh, and and maybe set aside the uh, the solution, if you like, the this particular stand, uh, uh, sorry, stand model. Maybe copy it to someplace else uh, for the moment, and go ahead and build your own version. Start with linear two dot stand as a template, uh, and modify that to be consistent with uh, with the model we're specifying for this example. Uh, for the second one, we'll just uh, we'll just do that as as a demo. So anyway, so that's my suggestion to do this as a bit of self study. Uh, I'm gonna actually I'm gonna pause for a little break uh, and then come back and basically show you the solution and go through uh, version two. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and start up again. Uh, so I left you with the, uh, some homework here to do the uh, to do our hands-on session one here. Let's go take take a look at it ourselves. Uh, we take a quick walk through. So let's start with uh, let's see right here our FXA inhibit average one. Uh, since closed down uh, our studio, so let's bring that back up. Okay, and let's get the corresponding, uh, actually let's make sure that that is set as our working directory. Boom, okay. Let's take a wander over to the model directory where we'll pull up the corresponding stand file because that's the one we're going to want to look at. Okay, so let's step back to the model itself, remind you what we were going for. Okay, let's go up to, okay, so this is the model we're going to do. Um, a lot of this is similar to our linear example. Uh, the key difference really is right here. Instead of having a linear function, we're going to have a sigmoid Emax function uh, in here. Uh, in addition, I, and I, I introduced a parameter you have, or a distribution you haven't used before, which is the uniform. So a couple of new things in here, but most of it's fairly similar to what we've done. So let's take a look at what the model code looks like for that. Okay, here we have it. So we have our data. 
Uh, recall before we had X and Y. Well, the equivalent to X and Y now is what I've called here C24 and FXA24, where C24 is that time average plasma concentration, and FXA24 is the uh, uh, that time average value for our percent um, inhibition of factor 10a. And uh, one thing I've introduced that's, that we didn't have before is notice in addition to having those two, I've decided instead of hard coding the number of observations, I've actually included that as a data item, which will pass in from the R script. Uh, so and that's going to be number of observations here. So uh, and that's going to be an integer, so I've declared it as an integer. Uh, I've stuck a lower bound of 1 on that uh, for the number of observations, and then I've declared each of our two items, are basically our x and our y value, to have that number of observations in there. Uh, maybe a comment I, before I've mentioned about um, bounds and just mentioned that a little bit about the role they play. Uh, when you specify bounds for data, the only point at which that's going to get checked is when it first reads in the data. Uh, I suppose in many, in a sense, it's really not, well, it, it isn't necessary to include it on data items, uh, but it's more of an extra check in here to make sure you didn't do something silly in your uh, in your R script and pass, you know, negative plasma concentrations or something in, uh, but other, but it only checks at that initial point where it reads in the data. Parameters are another story. Parameters, uh, when you put bounds on those, that's something that gets enforced all through the sampling process, uh, and so it's it's more critical in in the case where you're specifying parameters. So anyway, speaking of parameters, we've got our parameters block. And we have our various parameters. We have an Emax, an EC50, our gamma, uh, and sigma for our standard deviation in here. Um, recall we're going to specify that Emax be a uniform over 0 to 100. And we have to, if we're going to specify that for our distribution, we also need to specify it, uh, specify boundaries on those. Thus, you see both a lower and upper bound. In this case, lower equals 0 and upper equals 100. Our EC50, gamma, and sigma should all be uh, non-negative, so I've put lower bounds of 0 on all of those. Uh, and finally, I've similar to what we did with linear, where I declared that Y pred for our posterior predictions, I've declared this FXA24 pred, which we'll use to contain some uh, posterior simulations that we can use for doing our posterior predictive checks. Uh, then finally, inside model, uh, I'm going to go ahead and declare this FXA24 hat to hold our intermediate calculation for our predicted FXA24 value. Uh, then I'm going to specify my priors. Okay, so we've got our, here's you can see in, uh, in STAN, the distribution, uh, the uniform distribution is specified simply as uniform. Uh, and uh, then, so I've taken care of that with a lower bound of 0, upper bound of 100. Uh, and then I've specified for EC50 ga and gamma, recall I was specifying half normals. Well, of course you can't tell that if you just look at this, it just looks like normal. But that again, that gets combined with the bounds I placed on it when I declared the parameters, so that that combination of a lower bound of 0 and specifying normal means it's actually going to be a half normal 0, 250. And a similar thing for the gamma in here. And finally, our sigma of, uh, my sigma here is going to be half Cauchy, uh, 0, 10. Uh, by the way, something I should probably mention here, I, I mentioned there's the, uh, uh, you know, we have a manual, a user manual for Stan. It's probably worth mentioning, let me find the file things here. Let me go ahead and bring it up uh, a little something about where you can find information for some of these. So here I'm throwing out, you know, parameters or in distributions and so on. If you look uh, in, in here, you, you'll see there's several chapters. Let's look to where you can read it easier. It's kind of tiny there. 
you've got several chapters and things here. You have some general things about the stand modeling language, some example models in here that it describes. A uh, nice chapter on programming techniques, which gives you a lot of good ideas and so on. Uh, but sort of the reference manual part of it kind of comes down to when we get to where we describe the built-in functions, the distributions, the discrete and continuous distributions that are built in. And those are likely to be uh, commonly used reference sources for you. So for example, let's go ahead and jump, jump to our distributions. I'm going to pick our continuous distributions to begin with. Uh, so let's go ahead. So we've got our continuous distributions of various kinds. So you can see them listed like a normal. Uh, it gives you the usual background. And then the standard sampling statement that we've been using. And we'll talk more about some of the other kinds of statements they have there. But you have normal in here. Uh, you can go down. We've got, you know, uh, various things. Uh, they've, they've got all kinds of distributions. Exponentially modified normal distribution, a skew normal, student t, uh, and so on, and Cauchy, and so on. So it describes all of these, you know, uh, you know, so for example, one that we just used, where do we go here? Bounded continuous, probably there we go. The first one they list under that heading is the uniform, which is what we just uh, just used here. So anyway, there's an extensive uh, collection of information about the various distributions that are available. Okay, so we have that. Uh, so we have those, and then finally we're going to do our calculations uh, for the core part of our model. The first part here where I'm calculating this FXA24 hat will be to calculate our... Um, uh, calculate our sigmoid E max model. So notice, first of all, this is all in a loop going over the observations. So I equals one to n obs here for our observations. And for each one, we're indexing by I. And on the right, you can see our sigmoid E max model. Uh, exponentiation operator is a caret symbol, uh, just like R. Uh, in here, and otherwise it's pretty straight ahead. It looks just like the equivalent R function in here again, except for sticking a uh, semicolon on at the end. And then finally, our likelihood. It's just like our linear model. It just says, you know, FXA 24i is normal FXA 24 hat i sigma uh, for that. And so that specifies our likelihood. And here we're going to use a sampling statement for generating some posterior samples here. Uh, uh, where we throw that in FXA24 pred. Uh, the R script uh, is almost, you know, is very much like the one we did for, for the linear case, the particularly li the linear 2 example. Uh, and the main difference here, of course, is the data is, is specific to this model where we have to specify our number of observations and our C24 and FXA24. Uh, the other thing that's different here is I didn't hard code the data in here. I'm calling it in from a file, which you can see is located in the uh, data directory. In particular, well, data dir up here was defined as, uh, where'd it go? Here we go, right here. Uh, it's the data derived directory. So that's what I just went over here. I'm in data and then data derived. And the specific data we're working with is this one right here the fxa20 fxa.data.csv actually i'm sorry is that right now i got to remind myself which name am i using it's i think i was actually just misstated that where to go yeah it's fxa.data.average.csv which is this one yeah here i can do a quick view file here well it's just a it's a comma delimited thing, so it's not very nice to read the way I just brought that up. Uh, but you can see it's just a fairly simple, uh, you know, typical CSV file. Uh, okay, so we did that. I provide some initial estimates uh, for all of our parameters. And then a lot of the rest of this looks very much similar. Uh, right down to even the posterior predictive distribution thing looks the same other than changing uh, the names of the uh, 
uh, of the axes. So let's go ahead and run that thing. Okay, the usual fun and games. Go through, do our compile. Oh, that's right. It's something else I need to point out for you. Um, our stand actually, the stand function actually has some built-in capabilities to take advantage of uh, parallel computation uh, within a single computer. Uh, and I'll show that to you. Actually, maybe will it let me show that to you while it's running? I think so. Yeah. Let me go down. Uh, and now oh, where did I specify that excuse me oh yeah here we go forgot where I specified it uh, you can either do it at this stage or you can specify an argument in the stand function called cores but if in here where I specify the options MC cores equals parallel detect cores uh, I think that is sufficient to make uh, to make the fit statement uh, operate and yeah it will actually operate in parallel so if we go back to oh, it's already done uh, if you actually look at the thing going on up here uh, is okay sorry something was surprising me why it's not showing the which chain is associated with each of these, but you can see that the chains are sort of interspersed with each other. Uh, so it's actually doing this in parallel. Had we looked, I could have shown you that the um, uh, that uh, four cores were, were actually up and running at the time uh, when this was doing this. Okay, so it ran. Uh, we get some of our usual little uh, annoying messages, usually minor areas uh, where you have maybe uh, one problem along the way uh, those none of these are biggie for instance this statement here where it just had a count of one no problem we can ignore that uh, the one that's potential issue that we'll talk about later in an example is this statement where it makes reference to divergent transitions that's a potentially more serious problem again we'll cover that somewhat later where I can talk a little bit about potential remedies uh, for that uh, it turns out for this example, it's not exactly a fatal error, but in some cases, it's more problematic. But otherwise, things ran along just fine. Uh, let's see what it gave us back. Uh, we can go now. Notice under figure, we've got a new folder here corresponding to this model. Uh, similarly, we have a, uh, a table uh, fit here. Let's go ahead and bring up the table with our summary. Okay, uh, our hat looks good, so no apparent convergence problems. The effective sample sizes are all reasonably high here. Uh, and uh, we got all of our estimates in here. And we got our Emax of, uh, we got a posterior mean of about 88.8 .8 here, and EC50 about 115, a gamma that's pretty much sitting right around 1. Uh, with a fair amount of precision. It's got a 95% credible interval going from 0.87 to uh, 1.25 and a sigma of about 6. So let's see what the fits look like on that. And let's see here, so some of our diagnostics here uh, are, you know, well we already saw the R's in the table, those were all pretty clean. Uh, nothing shocking in our effective sample sizes or in our autocorrelation. Uh, here we've got our fuzzy caterpillars. Uh, nothing that, uh, you know, it all looks pretty clean like fuzzy caterpillars. Again, the only question is this when you have divergent transitions, it actually puts little red marks here at the sample where that happened. Uh, notice there's none after 
uh, that early time, so probably not a lot to agonize over. Uh, the uh, each chain seems to be describing roughly the same distributions. Uh, so we got our summaries here. You know, everything's pretty clean. Um, by the way, this is actually an example that sort of illustrates the strength of, of the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo simulation for this kind of a model. Uh, for Notice we've got some pretty extreme correlation between Emacs and EC50 uh, and also to some degree with the gamma estimates here. Uh, that's that's fairly common with uh, with asymptotic models like this where one of the parameters is essentially a measure of the asymptote and another is largely a measure of how quickly you get there uh, and and when when you do this model with a Gibbs sampler like bugs or with the or with non-mem uh, what you'll tend to find is that uh, that it causes a lot of problems with the sampling and you end up having to do very large numbers of samples uh, in order to get an adequate characterization. Alternatively, you can reparameterize the Emacs model so that the, the parameters that you're sampling are not so strongly correlated as the Emacs and the EC50. In fact, that's typically what I used to do with this particular example when I taught this course using WinBugs. Uh, but with the HMC sample, it can traverse these uh, sort of tight ridges that you get in the uh, posterior distribution quite well so that you don't have to resort to such strategies. Anyway, so anyway, just pointing out again a strength of the HMC sampler. And finally, here's a depiction of our posterior predictive check here where we're just looking at, again, just the, uh, you can see all the observed data and then the posterior median and 90% credible intervals about that, which do a nice job of describing the data. Okay, let's take a look at a variation on this model. Uh, in particular, let's go, um, let's see, we gotta go back up to, let's look at the model itself, the, the second version of this, where I introduce a couple of other things in here. Um, well, the key ones, we'll ignore a couple of these for the moment, but the key ones here uh, we'll see is where I introduce a couple of new, uh, a couple of new blocks. In particular, I'm going to introduce the transform parameters block and something called the generated quantities block, which are going to be new to what we're doing. And I just realized, I think I brought up, yes, I did, I brought up the wrong file here. Sorry about that. Here's the right one. There we go. Okay. Uh, so we've got, uh, okay, again, same thing. Transform parameters and generated quantities I'm going to introduce. Uh, the data uh, step is largely the same. We'll ignore the, uh, uh, the commented outlines for the moment. Uh, so data is the same. Parameters is almost the same, but in this case, for in parameters, I'm only including um, only including the sort of the core parameters of the model, uh, the derived quantities. We're going to instead declare uh, at least some of them inside the transform parameters block. And what I'm doing now is sort of breaking up the model calculations between transform parameters and model. Uh, and a couple of things I'm doing. One is uh, I'll go ahead and declare my, this intermediate calculation parameter here, that FXA24 hat. Let's declare it inside the transform parameters block. And what the transform parameters block is, that's where you can do all kinds of calculations that depend upon uh, both parameters and data in here. Uh, but what you cannot do in transform parameters is you can't have any uh, sampling statements like the prior distributions and the likelihood statement cannot appear in there. Uh, so usually what I tend to do is I usually uh, tend to put most of I guess what you might call the deterministic calculations in transform parameters and reserve the model block primarily for the stochastic components, the ones where we have sampling statements. 
So up here, you can see in transform parameters, I've moved my uh, calculation here uh, where I'm doing the calculation of the FXA24 hat. And that looks pretty much like we did before inside the model block, except I'm doing it, uh, except again, it's in this other block. Uh, the other thing is, is I'm not, the other key thing that I've changed is notice inside the model block, there's no loops. And in particular, there's no loop associated with the likelihood statement that I have right here. Uh, the priors are identical to what we had before. But recall before, in fact, let's go ahead and bring up the original one. The original one, uh, the likelihood statement was right here, and I calculated that separately for each, uh, each data element. Well, it turns out I can actually vectorize that. I can do it as a vector calculation and do it in all in one go without subscripting on those eyes. And, it, and besides being a cleaner statement in here and a simpler statement, it also turns out to be uh, beneficial from a computational point of view. Stan has been optimized to take advantage of this to more rapidly uh, calculate this. and. I'm actually not going to do, I don't think I'll do it right now, but uh, if you compare these two examples, you'll find that uh, this particular example does run significantly faster with the, uh, you know, with the uh, vectorized version of this than it does for, uh, for the unvectorized. The other thing I've done is, recall before uh, we did the posterior simulation right here, it turns out that's not very efficient for a number of reasons. Uh, for one thing, uh, probably the dominant reason why it's not efficient is the model state, the items inside the model block are calculated once for every leapfrog step in the HMC sample. Uh, and there can be actually quite a large number of leapfrog steps within a single HMC iteration. Uh, so, whereas when I do the calculation inside this generated quantities block, that is done only once per iteration, which can be, again, can be significantly fewer times. So if you can move calculations into this block because they're not really required for doing the fitting, uh, that's generally going to be more efficient than putting them inside either the model or the transform parameters block. So that's what I've broken these things out uh, in this way then. So, so again, I've moved the calculation of FXA hat up into the transform parameters block. I have vectorized the likelihood statement and I've moved the posterior prediction calculation down into the generated quantities block. Uh, that you see down here. So you can see I've now done my declaration for FXA24 head pred down here instead of in the parameters block. And I've got this calculation down here. Now one extra complication is the stand does not allow you to use the uh, sampling statement style notation inside the generated quantities block you have to use functions that explicitly are labeled uh, with having this underscore RNG hung on them uh, for doing the uh, random number generation, this RNG <laughs> in here. In addition, these particular functions are not vectorizable, uh, at least not yet. Uh, so you have to do that within a loop. Uh, but in this case, you're not paying a, 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 a computational, extra computational price for that. So you can see in here I have to actually say FXA24 pred i is going to be normal RNG uh, with, you know, with the corresponding mean and standard deviation in here. So this is a somewhat more efficient, it, it's a little longer to write, but it is more efficient computationally to use this approach for doing it. Uh, and I guess we'll go ahead for the fun of it and go ahead and run it. Go ahead and get the corresponding script file. I don't think, did I change anything in this? I think this is almost identical uh, to the other one, so we're not even going to look through that. 
Just go ahead and run it. Boom. Okay, that finished. Do we still have that? No, that one even had more divergent transitions. Again, we'll agonize over that later. Okay, so but but again, that should have run uh, successfully in that. Other than the, those issues, uh, let's see what the pictures look like. It should look pretty much the same. Uh, okay, maybe not. Let's see what it did. Ah, okay, yeah, for whatever reason, the divergent transitions are definitely causing some grief in this one. Um, and so the clues that I've got here, of course, you can see uh, this plot shows you where the divergent transitions are. And notice one of the chains seems to be going a little haywire uh, over here. Uh, and there's a hint of that over where the other one is, too. So that actually did cause some problems in this particular run. Uh, so we probably want to fix that. And you've got a hint here that uh, this one uh, chain is looking a little different than the others. So that is a problematic in this case. So I'm not happy with the way this one looks. You can see the fit doesn't look bad, but there is something, an issue there. So maybe I will show you one little trick that it actually tells you about when you do the run. Uh, let's actually go back up to this. Okay, so yeah, notice there's actually a message here about that. Let's sort of move this over here. Okay, so it says there's seven divergent transitions after warm-up. Increasing a DAP delta above 0.9 may help. C and this there's this particular reference here that talks about divergent transitions and things you might want to do about them. So that that's actually a worthwhile link to take a peek at. Uh, so actually, let me see what I actually had this set at already. Looks like I must have had it set at 0.9 because the default is 0.8. Oh, I did. Okay, I actually didn't tell you about this. Uh, this is the where it talks about adapt delta. It's a so-called control parameter, and there's a list of those control parameters, which are things that uh, which adjust uh, some of the parameters in the HMC algorithm. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and this is this delta is related to a step size in that. Let's see what happens if I make it bigger. If it doesn't resolve it, we'll talk about this later when we get to a later example where I more explicitly illustrate uh, an approach to dealing with it. Okay, let's uh, go ahead and run that. See if that helps any. Anyway, that, by the way, is the first thing you try, is to try adjusting the adapt delta, making it larger. Uh, to see if that resolves the problem. Uh, and the short answer to what you do if that doesn't work is you resort to reparameterization of your model. And did that help any? Apparently it did because it would have reported the uh, the divergent transitions right here. So anyway, that's an example of resolving those. And let's see if the uh, fitting diagnostics also indicate that things are looking a little better. Uh, that's certainly better, as is that. 
Okay, yep, no divergent transitions, no strange uh, carryings on going on there. Everything looks much cleaner. So that anyway, there's your, your first illustration of dealing with a sampling problem with HMC. Anyway, things are looking clean there. Okay. So let's move on to our next topics. Okay, we've sort of hit on this indirectly as we've gone through this, and I'll just uh, sort of reinforce uh, some of the message here about assessing convergence <clears throat> and a little bit about adequacy of sample sizes, though for uh, to speed this up a little bit, I'm going to sort of step over some of that. Okay, so with MCMC, uh, in general, the early samples may be unrepresentative of the target distribution, the target distribution in this case being the uh, posterior distribution we're trying to sample from. Uh, in addition, MCMC samples within a chain are autocorrelated with each other, uh, and a consequence of that is that inferences based on MCMC samples are less precise than those from the same number of independent samples. In addition, the autocorrelation influences the rate at which <clears throat> the rate at which the chains converge. Uh, so, how do you deal with uh, with those things? Well, one, you want to use a warm-up phase where you're going to discard early iterations that might not be characteristic of the your target distribution. Uh, in addition, the uh, recommendation is to monitor convergence using multiple chains uh, with different starting points. And you're looking for those chains to converge to a common distribution. Uh, you also want, the, like the chain history plots, to look more like you know, straight, horizontal, fuzzy caterpillars uh, rather than wiggly snakes. Uh, and uh, you may want to monitor some sort of diagnostics. Uh, the Gelman-Rubin diagnostics, and that's the R hat we've been looking at. There's also a variation on that that's termed Gelman-Rubin-Brooks plots, but I think the R hat is sufficient. Uh, and the R hat, it's essentially a ratio of the total variance to the within chain variance. Uh, so generally, you what you'd like is for that to be close to one. If you have chains that are somewhat divergent from each other, that will tend to make the total variance bigger compared to the within chain variance. Uh, so, and here I've put some history plots that illustrate problems. Uh, you can see, for example, this sigma here. Uh, notice that each chain is actually, the chains are completely separated, which clearly indicates that they're not describing the same distribution, so there's a problem there. Uh, here you've got our uh, this other one, this fee previous OAD. Uh, the chains are very much wiggly snakes. Uh, they're they're somewhat intertwined, which is a good thing, but they're still very slowly wandering. So uh, at the very least, you don't have enough samples, and there's even some hints that they things are still wandering off in a systematic direction. So that's not good. That's compared to what we see down here where everything looks pretty much like decent uh, fuzzy caterpillars and all of the chains are intertwined with each other. Um, I'm going to skip over the how many samples thing. It is important to get an adequate number of samples. For our own uh, purposes within this class, uh, the main focus that I'll use for that will be the effective sample size. We're looking for that to be reasonably large. Uh, you know, if your if your main if the inferences that you're interested in are mainly focused around characterizing the central tendency of your model parameters, then something in the you know. You know, if you're in the 500 to 1,000 range for your effective sample size, that's probably more than enough for doing that. If, on the other hand, the, your, uh, your key inferences depend upon tail probabilities or tail quantiles, those require a larger number of samples uh, in order to, uh, 
to get precise characterization of those quantiles or probabilities. So for example, if you're, maybe you've got a key go, no go decision that depends upon, you know, the a tail probability, uh, then you're going to want to generate much larger numbers of effective, you know, you want to want the effective sample size uh, for that quantity to be much larger. And as I mentioned in this, I give a reference, uh, a couple of references here if you're really interested in uh, learning more about, you know, how many samples uh, should you really be getting for different types of inferences. Okay, uh, next step in here I want to talk about is how we program hierarchical models or what we're in our, in pharmacometrics we're often referring to as population models, which are a specific category of hierarchical models. So let's start with sort of our typical population modeling case where uh, we're going to model two levels of variability, say inter-individual and residual variability. Uh, and we've got our data structured uh, in a way where you can sort of think of, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's mostly sort of a square table or equivalently, it's a bunch of equal length vectors uh, in here uh, where I've got data values for each observation associated with those. I have some individual identifier uh, in here for, uh, for each individual. Uh, and in this case, we're going to use consecutive integers beginning at one. So you like sub, you know, individual one, individual two, and so on. Uh, we might have some covariates in there and so on. Um, and in our data set, we're likely to also include a few constants, things like number of observations, number of patients, uh, perhaps the parameters of our prior distributions and so on in doing this. And as our demo for this, I'm going to do a, a hierarchical model for dose response. This essentially, this is a model-based meta-analysis, uh, model-based dose response analysis, where I've got my data consists of sample mean responses from five clinical trials. Uh, and in this case, the individuals in this are not individual patients. They're going to be individual clinical trials. So instead of, so our, the equivalent of inter-individual variation here will be inter-trial variation, and they're going to be modeled as random. Uh, here I've actually shown the entire data set off on the right-hand side here. So we're going to number our studies from one to five. We've got five studies. On the left, you can see a depiction of the plots here showing response versus dose. Uh, so you think of each data point corresponds to a treatment arm within a study and each curve is a study. So each color here corresponds to a different study in this list. Uh, so our data is going to be the study, the dose, uh, the sample size. Uh, because this is a meta-analysis, we're going to have to adjust our residual variance for the sample size here. And finally, the mean response. Uh, the model I'm going to use here is going to be a, an Emacs model with intertrial variation in both uh, E0 and Emacs. Uh, so, and I'm going to do a log normal uh, residual variation. So you can see that represented here. So my log of my response in the, uh, let's see which way did I use I and J here. So the, so the, it's the ith response in the jth trial, or actually it's really the ith arm in the jth trial uh, in this case. So the log of that is going to be normal, uh, log of e hat, uh, and our standard deviation is going to be some hypothetical individual patient standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Uh, and so essentially it's the standard error of those reported means. And, uh, and the E hat here is going to be just a simple Emacs model with a non-zero uh, intercept, so, which is going to call E0, then just Emacs times D over ED50 plus D. And notice I've got subscript, J, uh, subscript J's on E0 and Emax because I'm going to include inter-trial variation on those two parameters. And here you can see that I've got, I'm going to make 
E0 log normal, so I'm going to say log of E0 is normal uh, with some uh, central tendency, you know, E0 hat and a standard deviation, omega E0, and the same sort of thing for Emax. Got some, whoops, weekly informative priors. Uh, I'm sticking on these things. You can see I've got half normal uh, 0 to 10 uh, for the E0. Actually, that's kind of overkill now that I think of it. I may want to change those. But anyway, uh, E max is half normal, 0, 50. Uh, e D 50 is a half normal, 0, 50. Um, and let's see. Uh, and OK, sigma, I'm going to put half Cauchy, 0, 2. Did I? Yeah, I did half Cauchy, 0, 2s all the way across on these. And that kind of makes some sense in here because um, those, all of these are standard deviations associated with the log of a parameter. So you can keep in mind that the standard deviations there are approximate CVs uh, for these things. Uh, so the, this is actually relatively uninformative on these things because it's pretty much saying that the, uh, you know, the you know that it's highly probable that the value is well certainly uh, less than four and probably less than two in these cases in fact I could probably tighten those up without them being very informative okay so we've actually let's we'll go ahead and do the example here uh, we're going to be going to the files you see listed here uh, so I've called the model dose response MBMA1 Actually, what am I doing after that? Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, let me go through the slides first to point out how we're going to deal with the the hierarchical nature of the model. Uh, oops. Okay. So, uh, first of all, we're going to have to declare. Uh, this is just these are excerpts from the model uh, that we're going to write. Uh, we're going to have to declare values that correspond to the individual level values of E0 and Emax in addition to having their population parameters. So you can see how they're going to be N studies values of them. Uh, let's see, I seem to have declared them as vectors. I probably could have done them as, as a real arrays too. Uh, I'm trying to remember if I'm doing anything that would keep me from doing that. Yeah, I think I could have done them as real arrays too. Um, and and in the side the transform parameters block where I'm going to calculate my you know central tendency for the response based upon that Emax model well it's going to be you know the E0 plus the Emax part uh, in order to select the appropriate E0 value for a particular study I use nested indexing uh, as you can see here where I've got I'm going to get a value corresponding to study I. So remember in the data set, step back to that, the data set for each data item will have a value for the study, either one, two, three, four, or five. And so in here, so this value here is going to have a value of one of something between one and five uh, in here. Uh, to pick off the appropriate value of E0 for a particular study. So the, so the ith, basically the ith row of our data is going to contain a value study I which corresponds to that particular data item. Uh, and the same thing for Emax. We'll use the nested indexing for that uh, to calculate it. And all the other calculations are pretty much familiar characters here. Uh, and then finally in the model block, I'm going to be, in addition to specifying priors and the likelihood uh, for, the, for the response itself, I'm also going to be specifying uh, the distributions corresponding to the intertrial variation in E0 and Emax, uh, which in this case I've specified as log normals uh, in, in here. I could have either written this as log E0 is distributed normal or, or do it this way using the actual built-in log normal distribution in STAN. 
Okay, so let's take a peek at what the entire model looks like. Uh, okay, where we go? There we are. Uh, let's get some of the flotsam out of here. Start with a clean slate. In fact, let's start with a complete. Well, no, we won't worry about it. I'll just uh, clear out this. So it's not confused by that. <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's see. As long as we're in the script directory, let me go ahead and pull up the corresponding R script and then go over to the. Uh, oops, too far, too far up there. Let's see. Oh, that's right. I put it down here. I'm forgetting where I put that thing. Okay. Uh, let's go into the model directory here and pull up the corresponding stand file. Okay, here we go. Uh, so we've got you know a lot of data items in here. I'm going to specify how many studies there are, how many total treatment arms, which is equivalent to the total number of data points in this case, uh, and then. For each treatment arm, I'm going to have a study value, a dose value, a uh, sample size, and a response. So you can see for each one of these, we have, uh, we have a dimension of n arms for those. Uh, let's see, I declared uh, a couple of these things. I declared them as vectors in order to facilitate some vector-based calculations. Uh, in fact, my, the general rule I tend to use, though it's probably not critical, is I tend to start out when I write models declaring things as arrays uh, and switch them to vectors or um, vectors, row vectors, or matrices if certain calculations can be done more efficiently if they have those forms. Uh, so. But uh, anyway, that's kind of my loose rule of thumb on that. Um, okay, so my transform data in here, uh, I'm going to specify the likelihood in terms of the log of the response. So I'm just going to go ahead and transform the data right here. So my likelihood will be in terms of the log of the response rather than the original response value. Uh, then in parameters, uh, the first parts of these are just sort of the, our core population parameters. But in addition, I'm declaring uh, the individual level parameters, in this case, the individual trial level parameters uh, for E0 and Emax. Under transform parameters, like we did in the uh, previous example, I'm going to do my calculation of my sort of individual, uh, sorry, my calculation of the uh, the uh, sorry, the predicted values uh, within that particular block. So first I'll declare our, my response hat and then calculate it for each of the arms. So on the right hand side we've got our calculation of our Emax model with a non-zero intercept. And again, I, ha I use the nested indexing to pull off the appropriate value of the uh, parameters which are, have random effects on them, the E0 and Emax using the nested indexing. Uh, then inside our model, we've got all of our priors specified, just as we specified in the slide. Uh, we go ahead and do the uh, inter trial variability in E0 and Emax. And notice here I'm using a vectorized approach because each of these is going to actually generate five values here. So there's, because there's five trials for, so there'll be five E0s and five Emaxes, and those are each handled in a single statement. Uh, and then finally, for our final likelihood, I do the calculation here. I uh, do one other extra little trick in order to be able to vectorize this is I, in order to do this in a single statement, I had to vectorize this calculation right here because recall that if we go back to our original model statement, let's go up here, uh, the 
we have to sample size adjust our standard deviation here. Uh, and to do that, a couple of things are going on. Uh, for one, that's why I ended up specifying the sample size as a vector rather than as, a, as an array uh, here uh, so that I could do this vectorized calculation. And one other little trick here is right here. Uh, instead of uh, the standard deviation, or I'm sorry, the standard division uh, operator to, cannot do operations on vectors, uh, but they have a specialized one where they stick a period or a dot before it. So it's dot slash is a vectorized version of the division. There's also corresponding things for uh, for the other main operators like you know plus minus and and multiplication uh, that allows this to the end result of this then is actually going to be a vector of values corresponding to the uh, different observations in here. Uh, so so that's just doing the trick. Uh, the other trick in here is uh, where was I going here? Okay, is uh, is to do the square root. There is not a vectorized version of square root, but there is a vectorized version of exponential. So this is just a trick here uh, to be able to calculate the, uh, the equivalent of log n over the square root of 2. Okay, that was a long-winded way of saying calculate sigma over the square root of 2, or I'm sorry, square root of n uh, in a vectorized way. So that takes care of that. Uh, and then down in here, uh, we've got our generated quantities block, which gets a little bit more complicated uh, for our hierarchical model. To do the simple individual predictions uh, in here, we can actually just use the response hat we already calculated and just do this calculation here. Where I'm, where I just, uh, uh, well, this is sort of a long-winded way of doing a uh, log normal here, where I take the exponential of something where I've sampled from a normal distribution in here using the response hat I already generated back up in the uh, in the transform parameters block, and that will give me my individual predictions. And by individual predictions, I mean you're predicting a new value in the same trial as the ones that you analyzed. Uh, I use the term here, I, I stuck response and I stuck COND to indicate this is conditional on the, uh, on the individual estimates of our E0 and our, and our Emax here. So it's conditional on the, obser on the observed data for that particular individual or individual trial in this case. That's, and that would be a prediction analogous to an IPRED for non-MEM. Uh, for, uh, for the population predictions, we have to do a bit more uh, because in addition to, uh, to doing the simulation using that previous response hat, we actually have to generate a new response hat uh, to, you know, and generate new E0s and Emaxes based upon the population parameters because what we're now trying, when I mean population prediction, I mean we're predicting a, what you would expect for a new observation in a new trial. Uh, so it's going to be somewhat more variable because now we're actually simulating what amounts to essentially a, a bunch, a new trial or new individuals, if you like. Uh, and so to do that, I actually have to go through and simulate new values of E0 and Emax, which is what I'm doing here. And you can see I actually did use the log normal RNG in this case to generate those. Uh, and of course, again, there'll be one corresponding to each study, thus the loop going from one to n studies. And then for the, uh, to calculate the prediction here, I have to first calculate the corresponding response hat. And I stuck the word pred on those to distinguish it from the original response hat. 
And now, again, I use the nested indexing, but I'm applying it not to E0 and Emax, but to E0 pred and Emax pred to do the calculation. And then finally, response pred, which is going to be, again, my population prediction or the analog to pred within a, a non mem run. Uh, I calculate, excuse me, <coughs> I calculate again in much the same way as I did this previous calculation, but where I replace response hat with response hat pred. Okay, and if we go to the R script, uh, the main new thing in here, a lot of it looks similar. You know, the, obviously the data structure is a little bit different. Uh, but the data structure matches what we specified in the data block in the STAN model. Uh, the other thing which is different in our, in our initial estimates is I also provide initial estimates for the individual level parameters. Uh, technically, you don't have to, uh, but I find it often stabilizes the sampling process. Uh, particularly during the uh, the earliest sampling phase, so I generally recommend it. Uh, in this case, I didn't bother putting sampling them from random distributions. You can if you prefer, uh, but in many cases, uh, but I usually don't think of that as as critical as it is for the population level parameters. Okay, so we're gonna so I specify those, and otherwise it's very similar until we get down to my posterior predictive distributions. And the thing that will change there is I you as I do posterior predictive checks for both the individual predictions, what I called response cond, as well as the population predictions. Again, this is analogous to I pred and pred in a non-mem setting. Okay, let's go ahead and run this. I forget how long this takes. Hopefully not too long. Uh, oh, that's right. I need to pull these up. I might. Yeah, sorry. I forget which environment I'm in. Uh, okay. Um, I think we're still... Let me just double check that we still have the right working directory. We do. Let's just go ahead and run that guy. Okay, it looks like it'll run fairly fast. Okay. It's a pretty small data set, so I shouldn't be surprised. Okay, that finished. What did it say? Oh, it had some divergent transitions in that one, too. Okay. Didn't remember that that did that, but whatever. We'll see what it did to us. Okay, so let's take a look at what we got with that. Uh, let's actually look at the graphical diagnostics first. Uh, those are clean. Okay, nothing great. Yeah, there's some pretty, quite a bit of autocorrelation showing up in, in some of those. And let's see, yeah, we kicked off a few divergent transitions sort of down near the tail. Uh, there's maybe a hint of a little nonsense going with one of the chains there. Not, not sure how bad it is. Nothing super awful, I suspect, but it's still something we might want to resolve. Because um, otherwise they look like reasonable fuzzy caterpillars. Uh, each the distributions seem to be comparable for all the chains. Nothing shocking there. There's our individual level fits, yeah, and this is our population fits. So again, individual level is for predicting new observations in the same study. Uh, population predictions is for predicting new observations in a new study. 
uh, though in this case I'm simulating new studies that have identical designs to the original studies uh, that we that we fitted in this case. I think that was it. Yep. Uh, let's see. Uh, I can't remember if I need. What did we have here in our? See. Oh, I already had a DAP delta at 0.99. Okay, so. I don't think, yeah, I'm not going to bother to fix that with this. We will talk about reparameterization for dealing with, uh, with this. So Adapt Delta didn't fix it since I already pushed it up pretty high here. Uh, so we'll take a look actually in our next example for a strategy for, for dealing with it when that's not sufficient to resolve the problem. Okay, let's see where I was going after that. Ah, that was going straight to hands-on number two. In fact, so what I'm going to do here actually is let's uh, let me introduce that example to you. Oops, here we go. Oh, wait a minute! I jumped the gun. Where are we here? Yeah, I think I jumped the gun. Where am I going? Sorry, let me remind myself where I'm going here. Okay. Now, well, let's cover a little bit more before I get to hands-on example two. Okay. Uh, I'm going to try and describe uh, the individual and, po and population predictions uh, in a slightly different way than I did as we were going through that example <coughs> in a way that seemed to has helped other people in the past. So let's see if it works for you. Okay, so in this schema, I'm going to, let's identify sort of some key elements in here. Uh, so first of all, uh, up here, theta represents our sort of the, our core model parameters or what you might call sort of the population parameters. So in the examples we just did, this was the things that we would include, like the E0 hat and the Emacs hat and so on uh, here. Uh, but in addition, uh, we have individual specific parameters in our model. Uh, so, and what I've called here is theta j, is these would be the parameter values uh, conditioned on the jth individual's data. Uh, these would be very much like what, uh, uh, you know, what you would call the post hoc estimates or the uh, empirical Bayes estimates, if you're used to using non-MEM, for example, uh, that you get out here. So, so, so those would be the individual level parameter estimates in here. Uh, so those, so we've got those down here. We have our observed data uh, uh, being represented here. So, uh, when we analyze our observed data, uh, we use that to estimate both the individual level parameters as well as the population level parameters up here are theta. So, so we've got those. Now, given the individual level parameters, we can, we can make predictions about, uh, about, you know, possible future data in the same patients given those individual parameters and that's the thing I was calling individual predictions uh, and so you calculate those using these particular parameter values here in a sense once you've got the individual level parameters you no longer actually need the population level parameters because these are sufficient to to make predictions for new observations in those same individuals but now suppose I want to make uh, predictions about future individuals. Well, to do that, I actually need my population parameters, including the uh, parameters describing inter-individual variation, to predict new sorry to predict new parameter values for those new individuals, I, and I would in turn use those values to make predictions. Uh, about not just the parameter values, but on uh, on predicted you know observations. Put those in quotes, I guess, uh, for those new individuals. And thus, those are my what I was terming population predictions, or predictions for new observations 
in a new individual. Uh, so you can see how the dependencies happen uh, when we do the calculations. So you have your data that leads to estimation of your individual level parameters and your population parameters. But if I want to make simulations for the same individuals, I would just use the individual level parameters to do that. But if I want to make predictions for new individuals, I again have to generate new uh, individual level parameters and, and new data from those. Okay, next step. Uh, let's talk a little bit about prior distributions. Uh, this is just a fairly brief discussion, uh, just to sort of help us uh, as we're thinking about priors uh, in our subsequent examples. Uh, first of all, I recommend you think of prior distributions as part of your models. Uh, and priors should be chosen and subjected to scrutiny, uh, much like other model components. Uh, similarly, model checking uh, should ideally include not only sort of checking that what you usually think of as your model or the likelihood, but they should also explore uh, the prior. In particular, ideally, they would include a, some sensitivity analysis uh, regarding your prior to, in order to assess you know, how much impact the priors are having on your estimates. Uh, and I comment also that choice of priors is most critical when you're dealing with sparse or limited data. In other words, those very cases where the prior distribution may have an influence on your parameter estimates and prediction of future values. A uh, uh, place I recommend taking a look, there's a, a nice little uh, discussion about uh, prior, rec you know, choice, choosing priors uh, by the STAND team. Andrew Gelman, I think, started this and others have contributed also to it uh, at this link. So that's worth a look. Uh, and some of the discussion I have here is, uh, is derived from that. So first, let's start thinking about what is the function of a prior distribution? Uh, well, one of the most common functions of a prior distribution is to represent prior knowledge. Uh, and to and to uh, and to use the Bayesian strategy where you combine that prior distribution with your data to make inferences that are conditioned on both that prior knowledge and and the data. But so another reason why you might specify a prior uh, is, so what we're loosely terming regularization to facilitate the computation uh, of some of the parameters, particularly parameters that you might consider less critical for, uh, for inferences. Uh, typically, if you're using it as a sort of a regularization strategy for the computation, uh, you're usually picking uh, what I would term sort of weakly to moderately informative priors. They're not the kinds of strongly informative priors you might use to represent prior knowledge. Um, and an example here uh, is something like a Cauchy distribution where most of its mass is in what you might consider a plausible range given whatever your state of knowledge is. But it has heavy tails uh, that allows you to diagnose uh, any discrepancies between, uh, you know, the posterior and the prior. In other words, they're not so strong that they preclude the possibility of, of surprise, if you like. But on the other hand, they provide enough regularization to facilitate uh, efficient sampling using MCMC methods. Uh, something that also comes up is, you know, what does it mean to be informative, uninformative, or weakly informative? Uh, and I'd argue that those notions are actually not that well defined, but, uh, but I'll make an attempt at some loose definitions that we can use as kind of working definitions uh, as we're going through this. Uh, what I'm terming a weakly informative prior would be a prior that rules out unreasonable parameter values but is not so strong as to rule out values that might make sense. Uh, granted, that's rather a, a pretty loose statement, but you know the idea is you're trying to uh, put most of the probability in what you would consider a reasonable range, 
but also allow for the possibility of surprises again, much like that discussion I had around the Koshi. Uh, then there are informative priors, which is a prior that purposely represents information intended to influence the posterior distribution. Typically, this would be to capture prior knowledge. Uh, in other cases, you might do it explicitly to challenge the analysis with competing points of view. You know, so for example, you might uh, choose choose a uh, an informative prior that represents a pessimistic perspective, and then choose another prior that represents an optimistic perspective, and then compare what the results are uh, as part of your analysis. And then there's so-called uninformative priors which uh, ostensibly would be a prior that represents no information and therefore you know, lets the data tell the story. Uh, a typical example that might often be cited for that would be something which is constant over the entire real line, which is actually considered an improper prior because it doesn't integrate to one like a proper uh, probability distribution, but is often used as, a, um, as an uninformative prior. Uh, but I here I caution you that sometimes that thing that you think is an uninformative prior might not be an uninformative prior. And uh, my counterexample here is uh, suppose you use a an improper prior for a standard deviation. And in particular, let's say you, you now since a standard deviation has to be non-negative, you might use something which is constant over the entire positive real line. Well, that means that all positive values are equally likely. And, you know, gee, that sounds like a reasonable definition of, of uninformative, doesn't it? But that means that the prior assigns infinitely more probability to the set of values greater than any fixed value you might care to choose. Uh, so pick any value, you know, 1, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, a billion. No matter what number you pick, there's always infinitely more probability greater than that value in that distribution. Uh, and that will tend to bias the posterior to high values. Uh, and the bottom line to that is that a uniform distribution does not automatically confer uninformativeness. Uh, you have to take care in how you apply it. So anyway, those are just a few things that... Uh, to, to be considered along the way. You'll see that in much of the following examples I'll use, I probably don't attempt to be completely uninformative. Instead, I will tend towards what I would term weakly informative priors uh, that, you know, that rule out, you know, really extreme values. Uh, because in most cases, uh, we're dealing with models where we have some notion of at least the order of magnitude we're working with. So I will exclude things which are, you know, you know, you know, or many orders of magnitude, bigger or smaller uh, than what we would one might consider reasonable. Uh, there will also be examples I'll use where I explicitly use informative priors because they're intended to represent prior knowledge. Uh, which in many cases we have when we're dealing with more mechanistic models along the way. Okay. So, and then a brief note about truncated priors uh, using STAN. Uh, we've actually already seen examples of those where we've used truncated prior, tr sorry, truncated distributions uh, in the case of truncated priors. Uh, and in the, that, for prior distributions, Specifying parameter bounds is sufficient to represent uh, truncation on prior distributions. So you've seen the half normals I've used and half Cauchy's. Uh, that would be fine. But for for distributions which are uh, that occur elsewhere, which do not represent prior distributions, but uh, other distributions within in our models, uh, we have to use a somewhat different strategy. Uh, and so, as I say here, truncated priors for derived parameters um, or data, we have a, there's a particular syntax in here where we modify a distribution using this modifier that's represented by a T, uh, and then in parentheses we have uh, 
well, you would have a lower and upper bound uh, with inside that. So, for example, suppose we have our, you know, maybe our data we want represented by a truncated distribution that has some lower and an upper bound instead of, you know, so where it's a truncated normal, I would say y, or y is normal with some mean and standard deviation, and then immediately adjacent to that normal distribution, I would put this t with a lower and upper bound in here. Uh, in addition, if you leave either of the bounds blank, that, that represents an infinite bound on, on that side of it, so you don't have to specify both bounds. Uh, so that would be a way of saying, okay, I want a normal distribution truncated below by L and above by U. Uh, similarly, when I declare my Ys, I would want to also include those bounds uh, when I do that declaration. Uh, some limitations with truncation is you can only apply it to univariate distributions and you can't vectorize this statement. Uh, so you would ask, so if mu, if say y is actually a group of values, you'd have to enclose it in a loop to deal with that. And then I just also put an admonition here that this is not the same thing as censoring. Uh, we'll talk about censoring a bit later, but that's a different creature than truncation. Okay, so finally we get to hands-on example two, uh, where you get to do uh, something with... Um, uh, something with uh, with a hierarchical model, a population model in this case. In this case, the individuals really are individual people uh, rather than trials like the example I had. So we're actually going to be using sort of the same data we did before with our hands-on example one, except we're not going to time average it like we did before. Uh, we're going to use all of the, the raw data in here. So we're going to, particularly, we're going to do PKPD modeling on the time-matched biomarker in PK data this time. Uh, this is actually the same specification as before as the, as the trial. It's, again, except we're not going to time-average the data. So we're going to do a direct-action PKPD model on those time-matched factor 10A inhibition and ME2 plasma concentration data. So again, we're working with the same data. Here we're looking at uh, the time courses for both the plasma concentrations and the factor 10A inhibition. But in effect, what we're doing is modeling what you see on the left. Uh, so these are spaghetti plots for factor 10A inhibition versus uh, the plasma concentrations. So basically, we're going to be fitting all of these individual curves using a population model. Uh, and the model we're going to use, uh, we're going to use a sigmoid Emax model with no intercept on this. Uh, so it's similar to what we had before, except again, we're not doing time averaging. Uh, and we're going to put some inter-individual variation on which one? On EC50. And we'll keep it simple and just do it on one of the parameters just to, to illustrate this for the hands-on example. Uh, our Residual variation is just our, so our effect here, our percent inhibition is going to be normal with some mean, our E hat, and standard deviation sigma. Uh, our predicted values here are going to be our uh, sigmoid Emax model where we have inter-individual variation, whoops, on the uh, EC50. Thus the uh, subscript J on the EC50 parameter. Uh, in here, and that's going to be log normally distributed, uh, as shown here in this statement. Uh, we'll use some weekly informative priors, fairly similar to what we did before. Uh, you know, E max is going to be uniform 0, 100. We've got some half normals on EC50 and gamma, and half Cauchy's on the uh, on our omega EC50, the standard inter-individual standard deviation. Uh, for our EC50 and our residual uh, standard deviation here. Uh, the data uh, is, whoops, the data, uh, you can see here, I've, it's this file, fxadata.csv. Uh, we can actually take a peek at that if you want, just so you can get a visualization on it. Uh, let's see, data, boom, 
2.5. See, that's the FXA to this one. Make that so you can see it a little better. Okay, so it's just a simple table here. It's got a bunch of stuff we're actually not going to use. Uh, we've got some covariates here we're actually not going to use in, uh, at this point. Uh, so the key things you're going to want to use are going to be basically subject, uh, concentration, and this is the factor 10A inhibition. So you're those, yeah, those are really the only um, objects we're going to use in the data set. Dose is, is not used in this model because we're going to use concentration directly uh, as part of the model. Uh, the subject, I've already set this up so that it's they're numbered in uh, consecutive order, one, two, three, and so on, up to however many subjects uh, are in this. So that's our data set we're going to work with. Uh, again, I would, similar to what I recommended before, uh, I suggest you maybe put aside the uh, the the stand model file and try to build it up yourself. Uh, there is a corresponding R script uh, that don't bother trying to build. Uh, you know, if you want to, feel free to build it yourself, but you can uh, certainly work with it directly. The main thing I recommend that you learn is how to build the stand model uh, component on here. Uh, this bit about the non-centered parameterization to remove or sorry, to improve sampling efficiency and prevent divergent transitions. We'll walk through that after you have a chance to take a look at the original uh, before we uh, explore that particular strategy. So that's my recommendation is to take a look at that. I'm actually going to break off now and uh, let you uh, take a shot at that uh, on your own. And then uh, I'll come back and we'll take a look at it. Okay, bye for now, and uh, we'll resume after you've taken a shot at it.